You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Brett Kugelmas. Brett Kugelmas is the founder and chief executive officer of Last Energy. A visionary entrepreneur and engineer, he has been a leading voice on the essential role nuclear energy plays in achieving deep decarbonization and energy security for the near future. In 2017, he founded the Energy Impact Center, a Washington, D.C.-based research institute. Over the course of five years, EIC engaged in intense global industry and governmental collaboration, becoming an internationally regarded thought leader on the role of nuclear power in accelerating the transition to clean energy. He navigated the organizational transition, leading EIC to become a full-fledged commercial developer of small modular reactors emerging as last energy. With the goal of revolutionizing the delivery model for nuclear power, Last Energy aims to accelerate the global energy transition to abundant clean power, ushering a new future of human flourishing. Brett Kugelmas, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Now, Brett, the great, one of the great achievements of human civilization was the harnessing of the atom. Hmm. And it didn't start out so well, but it turned out to be something of immense use and energy production, something that we exponentially are requiring increasing amounts of energy and we need to do it cleanly. We have a planetary problem to fix. It seems time to re-examine nuclear energy. How do we do that? And more importantly, before we get to that is why aren't we, <laughs> why don't we have a planet full of nuclear reactors right now? Why is this, what, what actually stopped the progress in nuclear energy uh, development? That's a great question, and that's also the right question to be asking, because like when you look around, it's 10% of world electricity, 4% of all energy produced on planet Earth, 20% of U.S. electricity. Most people don't realize this. Like it's, it's not as if it was this like little thing that we tried and didn't work. It is this thing that we've proven. I mean, some countries have just gone, I mean, like France went you know, 80% nuclear, South Korea, Sweden, half nuclear each. It's like... It's it like it's been demonstrated as this incredibly useful energy source in terms of its stability, it, you know, the security that it provides for a nation in terms of its clean energy benefits, in terms of its low land consumption. I mean, it's just it's incredible in so many ways, and it scaled up to like non not insignificant percentages of global energy. So like, why not just take it all the way, right? Why not take it from ten percent? to 100% and totally decarbonize the whole planet. I mean, that's pretty easy to conceptualize, right? If you were to say, hey, everyone, everywhere there's, where there's one nuclear building, where by the way, there's always plenty of land around the two, just put nine of those buildings and all of a sudden we've totally decarbonized the whole planet. That's like pretty amazing. And, we, and yet we don't do it. So what's going on there? I spent six years now digging into that exact question. You know, the first two under uh, under the umbrella of a research organization I founded, the Energy Impact Center, and then these last four, as, you know, as a commercial entity, you know, Last Energy. And the conclusion we came to pretty early on was that the nuclear industry was its own worst enemy. The nuclear industry itself was the cause of the stagnation, not uh, not you know what, what you know what other people would describe to like okay the environmentalists or the oil and gas industry or there's none of this you know surreptitious uh, you know conspiracies as to what brought down nuclear and the only explanation that actually does make sense is that it was uh, market based incentives led to what I call the self cannibalization of nuclear power plant development as the industry engaged in like pretty predictable rent seeking behaviors as economists would call it. And then it's just remained stuck for decades. And now it's, you know, here's our opportunity to unstick it. Now, unsticking it, the biggest objection I've heard over the years from many people regarding nuclear energy is that building plants are, is just so expensive. They're right. But they're right. But does it have to be so? Exactly. That, and that, I mean, listen, you were asking just the right questions in just the right way. It, it, yeah, it, that is a real problem. It takes too long to build. And they're too expensive. And yeah, if you were to like look at the recent performance of nuclear power plant development, you say this is not a viable solution. 
So why am I so confident then that it is not just a viable solution, it is the solution? Well, if we look historically at what it costs to build these power plants, it is the cheapest, fastest way to scale up energy ever known to mankind. And we only made it worse and worse over time. But if you look at, you know, there's these, there's this pair of reactors, you know, point beach one and two out in Wisconsin, you know, 500 to 600 megawatts each, right? So uh, a little, little over 1100 megawatts in total. They built them for under $1,000 a kilowatt, which is like ridiculously cheap. And that's all inflation indexed. And they built them in under three years. That's 1100 megawatts. You know, today, when we build 1100 megawatts, it costs 10 times as much and takes five times as long. Um, so we're just doing it wrong, and we have ex exact proof. We have empirical evidence on how to do it right. And what is that evidence? I mean, how in in your vision, how do we do it right? Well, here here's the problem. We've created like a legal construct that no longer allows us to do what we did historically. So historically, what they built were these really simple. I mean, they look pretty much like a coal plant, except you swap out the hot rock. Really simple structures, pretty small structures. Not much to it, no craziness. And that works, right? These like 500-ish, 550-ish megawatt reactors and just do that. And then when you get to this point where you keep building them bigger and bigger, you get all of these like hidden costs crop up that you didn't expect, including even the cost of capital, which most engineers don't even think about because they're not financial engineers, they're mechanical engineers. And so they're not thinking about like how just making a bigger system costs more from a strictly financial perspective. But so that's one way to do it, is literally what we built in 1968. Like those reactors were amazing. You could build them all around the world. It would be simple, it would be fast, and it would be the solution. But we have changed the rules of the game such that you cannot build that. If I were to like look at an operating reactor today that is deemed totally viable by every regulatory authority to run today, that Point Beach 1 and 2 example, um, and I, I were to ask for permission to build it exactly, bolt for bolt, bolt concrete for concrete, everything, you know, turbine for turbine, everything the exact same, the, the regulatory authorities would not let you do that. They wouldn't, we wouldn't have come close to letting you do that. Um, yet they let those reactors run. And so there's just like this huge incongruity between uh, what our uh, reg regulations permit uh, and, you know, and what your... Uh, like and, and like what is like a practical feasible like logical implementation strategy so well we have decided so i'll take a break there because i've been talking a while but then i'll i'll get to like what we have done to fix this problem if not just do the most logical thing that we already see out there well let's get in directly into that as far as all right so we can build simple reactors that work can we build them small and can we build them cheaply and do it that way as opposed to, you know, break the thinking yeah. of, of the gigantic mega plant type of uh, thinking. Exactly. Now, what can we do in a modular way, a way to make nuclear reactors cheap and available and safe? Exactly. 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 So, yeah. So, OK. So let's think about if we can't build these these 550 megawatt reactors that were just like so simple and so affordable and so fast to build because the rules don't allow it anymore how else can you achieve these cost efficiencies and time efficiencies well instead of capitalizing on economy of scale of size right which obviously like breaks at a certain point the gigawatts you're not getting economies of scale of size but at 550 megawatts you are you have to go to economies of scale of many and so this is our strategy to get as cheap as the economies of scale of size of the 550 megawatts. What we have to do is we have to build a lot of smaller ones that are feasible under the current regulatory construct. So we have decided to take the standard PWR technology, shrink it down to 20 megawatts, put all the extra systems in so it conforms to today's regulatory standards, but use modular manufacturing in order to be able to ramp up production of them such to the point that we can bring the per unit cost back down to what you'd achieve very simply from the economies of scale of size with the 550 megawatt ones. So yeah, so our intention as Last Energy is to take the standard technology and focus on replication, build as many as possible. And the way that we're going to do that affordably is the same strategy that you know Tesla employed. When they were started making cars, they sold a very expensive car as a premium product, the Roadster to hire customers who were willing to pay more until they got the hang of making 
not just one or two or a thousand cars, but many thousands of cars. And then they can, you know, have these manufacturing facilities and processes and supply chain efficiencies in place to be able to deliver a lower cost product than the Model S, than the Model 3. And so we're going to follow that same playbook with our last energy 20 megawatt reactors. They're going to be expensive to begin with, but we found a set of customers. We've been very successful at finding customers that are willing to pay more money because of their unique circumstances. And those are who are going to get our first 100 power plants. And only then, when we have the manufacturing factory and supply chain efficiencies and internal processes and have reduced our own cost of capital, only then are we going to be delivering a more affordable version to the more price sensitive customers. And we're going to keep following that playbook until we get 10,000 nuclear reactors deployed across the world. Now, once you have that in operation, 10,000 nuclear reactors, does that solve our energy problem? We obviously can build more as needed, but is that is that it? I mean, would that do it? Yeah, so not really, not the small ones. At some point, you have to increase in size again. But my theory is build a bunch of small ones to get practice building stuff. Then you find a location in the world that doesn't have the same regulatory burden that we have self-inflicted on bigger scale reactors that make them cost prohibitive at this point. And we can get into what those nuances are in a little bit. But then you build a bunch of big ones and you create these energy islands and use these energy islands to produce synthetic fuels, carbon negative materials. And that's how you decarbonize. Going, We're going small to go many, to go big, to go to a carbon economy. Uh, that's that's our plan as a company. That's very nice. I, I really like the idea and I'm glad someone's doing it finally. I've <laughs> I've languished in this 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 sort of 30 year period of of just knowing that we were we were we had an energy solution that we were not pursuing. And it was actually to the point where it really was unpopular to even talk about it. Yeah, I know, I know. Nuclear energy. And I, I'm hoping we're past that because if we would have pursued nuclear energy and continue to pursue it from 1970 until now, we might not have so much of a carbon problem. Would you agree with that? Totally. Yeah, yeah. It would be, yeah, it would be a non-issue. But I think even there's, there's something even more important because sometimes we get too focused on climate. Like I think just as important is like energy poverty and like bringing the whole world out of poverty and creating like an energy abundant world. I mean, climate change will hurt like a billion people in one way or another, but energy poverty already hurts a billion people now. So it's like we got to like we got to think about energy poverty in addition to climate. Well, that is, yeah, that's an entire problem because the the basically the the start of getting developing country into an advanced country economically is invariably going to involve energy. Yep. There's just no way around that. And exactly. everything from food production, everything is in this chain. And if we had a cheap source of energy that could be deployed to any country in the world, uh, you know, put one in Antarctica if you want, it, you, then it, that's the game changer because it allows human progress to continue unabated without tightening the belt or anything like that. And whenever you do that, you're obviously punishing the, the poorest people the most. This gives us a way past that. But what everybody's going to ask about in the comments is safety. Sure. And I, I want to note that Look, we've had many, many, many years of development and thinking on the engineering of nuclear power plants. They're not what they used to be. And the fact is we can probably make them foolproof and safe now. Wouldn't you agree with that in that the the age of the nuclear disaster is over? I disagree with the underlying premise of your sentiment that there was something wrong with the old reactors. I actually think that we have totally misbranded the hazard around what is a nuclear meltdown altogether. Nuclear meltdowns do not hurt people. They are not catastrophes. Anyone who tells you otherwise has simply not looked at the data. We should first separate Chernobyl, which was actually not a nuclear meltdown. That was a nuclear explosion. And a different kind of reactor, too. Uh, yeah. We said it, that was a, that was a, what was it, a graphite reactor. That's a completely yeah, so, different thing. And it was a dual purpose. So that reactor was designed to make plutonium, to make bombs, to destroy America. Let's just like remember that. And like, so the industrial accident that happened there was a bomb making factory. Okay. And that is a totally different type of reactor. Exactly. When there's a meltdown, it implies that it's like a water based reactor, right? So the water boils off. Actually, the, the main nuclear action, the reaction stops at that point, but there's still residual heat. And that residual heat starts melting the internal structures, including the fuel, and that is what creates the meltdown. 
Meltdowns don't hurt people. And we've got four examples of meltdowns in which there wasn't a single injury. Three Mile Island, Fukushima 1, Fukushima 2, and Fukushima 3. These are gigawatt scale, so big old plants melt down and nobody gets hurt, despite in the Fukushima uh, example of every single safety system failing. So it's not like, oh, these mad, thank God these magical safety systems helped us, otherwise it would have been a catastrophe. Every single safety system failed and still no one got hurt because the meltdown is not a hazardous event to begin with. And that is what everyone has wrong. So no, I'm not going to sit here and disparage the old nuclear industry and say, for technology purposes, and say, my technology is better. I'm going to say it was never a problem to begin with. And our technology is able to bring an affordable nuclear power plant to market in today's era. It brings up things too that it that industry got such a bad image. And you had things like the, the movie, The China Syndrome. And <laughs> to, I'll let you explain the problems with ideas like the China syndrome. Yeah. And once again, I'll offer a bit of a heterodox thesis here. Like the bad image of the nuclear industry came from the nuclear industry. So so this, this China syndrome was a movie that was all about fear of like a nuclear meltdown. And Three Mile Island happened like right after that movie came out. And so people conflate those two events with the downfall of the nuclear industry. But the nuclear industry was dead before those came out. Like before the movie came out, before the meltdown happened, the nuclear industry was already dead. You can, we, can, we can look through the old contracts and show they were all canceled before that happened. So obviously it had nothing to do with the end of the industry, but what it did have to do with was the birth of a new industry, an industry that didn't sell nuclear reactors, but one that sold a fear of nuclear reactors. So what the nuclear industry did after Three Mile Island, looking around and saying, shoot, our old business was like totally gone before this. We need a new business. They looked around, saw people were afraid of nuclear, and instead of doing what a healthy industry does and help quell those fears, they leaned into them and they said, you're right, public, nuclear accidents are the scariest thing. Now let us come in and sell upgrades to all of the existing nuclear plants in order to make them safe for you. And that's when nuclear safety culture began, and that's when this self-cannibalization, rent-seeking behavior really first ticked off in terms of the nuclear industry repositioning themselves to say, Trust us, nuclear energy is dangerous and we're going to sell you safety systems to fix it. And that's what they've been doing for the last 40 years, scaring the shit out of everyone and making tons of money along the way, but making it very difficult to build new reactors. That's 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 just uh, dumbfounding <laughs> yeah. when you realize what actually happened. Yeah. Now, another question people are going to ask is, what do we do with the waste? What do we do with the spent rods? Now, I want to point something out here really quickly. Yeah. France has figured out ways to really efficiently recycle that stuff. And is that part of your plan is to uh, use as much, you know, efficiently use the fuel as best we can before we even get to waste? And what do we do with it once, once we have it? Yeah, that's not our plan. Nuclear waste is not dangerous. Nuclear waste has never hurt a single person, place, or thing in all of human history. Once again, it is the existing nuclear industry lying to you, telling you that it is hazardous, even though the one hazardous radioisotope, iodine-131, decays, like it's 99.9% .9 gone after just 90 days, right? Because it's got an eight-day half-life. That's the only radioisotope that's ever hurt anyone coming out of a power plant. So that's gone after three months, not millions of years. And yet the nuclear industry tells you it's dangerous for millions of years, so they can get paid to protect you from it for millions of years. This is the other business model of the incumbent nuclear industry. Le like lean into the fear, promote the fear of radiation and of nuclear power plants to sell you safety systems and waste disposal methodologies that are insanely expensive and make it so it's an unconquerable problem. So the federal government just always has to spend more money on it. Like that is their strategy as an industry. And that's why people, it's not irrational. People are very rationally afraid of like radiological material because the radiological experts are telling them that it's dangerous. But people just have to realize like they're selling you something. Always found it kind of funny is that people that like antiques and they see these old pieces of green glass from the 19th century without ever realizing it's uranium. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's uranium in the environment and there's nothing we can do, especially seawater. Now, can we, now how are we going to mine the uranium? I mean, can we actually extract it from seawater easier than we could, say, in a mine? I, I think seawater is like, ex, like uranium extraction from seawater is like going to be an incredible technology in the future. But extracting from a mine right now is just so ridiculously cheap, we don't really have to invest in that technology. The minute that we run out of discoverable land-based resources, which isn't going to happen for hundreds of years, 
we can switch to seawater extraction technology and that'll get us another billion years because the seawater is actually in a constant state of leaching uranium salts from the crust of the earth itself. So it's like incredibly self-replenishing up until the point of like billions of years of energy production and our planet's only going to last 500 million years. So it's like, um, yeah, seawater is going to be the next phase of, of uh, uranium extraction, but we don't have to worry about it for a while. It's actually kind of funny if you think about it, because you're cleaning the seawater, <laughs> essentially, by, yeah, by removing the uranium, you're actually making pure I know. water. I know. It's, it's, a, it's, you know. it's an amazing concept in general. I mean, this is what like energy abundance enables. We can essentially create these giant filtration devices for the ocean and for the air and remove anything that is toxic or that we don't like out of them. Like what people don't realize is every breath you take, you're breathing in some arsenic like little arsenic atoms that are just kind of floating around in the air because like arsenic is part of our modern industrial production system and little bits get into the air and then float around the air. And so every breath you take, you are inhaling arsenic. So yes, we could develop these like giant global air filtration systems that capture all of these like valuable metals and materials that we don't want to be breathing and puts them back into industry in an economically productive way. But the backbone of that system has to be abundant energy. And that's the other thing, too, is that, all right, if you look at nuclear accidents and they're actually not really that threatening, compare that to how many people globally die from pollution each year. I, mean, I know. I know. It's crazy. If you could eliminate that by switching to electric cars run by nuclear power plants, you would save millions of people per year and we'd have much cleaner air, you know, as a result. Yeah, or all sorts of, there are other clean fuels as well. Like, it's not just, yeah, we don't want to be burning coal or like dirty gasolines and stuff, but there's... Like chemi we shouldn't disparage chemical energy. I think chemical energy has huge advantages over battery-based systems, which, by the way, also have environmental like pollution issues. So I, I, I'm not actually one of these guys who says, like, we have to move towards, like, a fully electric world. Like, I actually don't believe that. I think it should be, like, clean, like, chemical energy delivery with some electrical energy delivery and just, like, like an incredible amount of energy abundance to get us there. Well, once again, though, it's all interconnected because in order to make the fuels, you're going to need the energy. So yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's how you produce it, and that's the big problem: is that producing anything is just requires so much energy, and as a result, the way we do things now with coal-fired plants and things like that, it's producing carbon. So if we go to a system where that's not the case, which is nuclear, then there's no carbon, and the energy source is just essentially limitless, as as you explain. Now. Other applications uh, beyond power you know, here on Earth, is it conceivable that we could actually find a use for a nuclear reactor like this, a compact one, in space as we explore, or is it just better to go with some other thing, fusion or something like that? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of applications for nuclear power in space. I, like I, I struggle a little bit because like I'm not the expert in those systems and they get like pretty far out there in terms of technology spectrum. So I don't want to like, misrepresent it in some way, but I think there are nuclear reactors. There's all sorts of types. There's like these ones that just like generate heat from decay material that aren't real. Like, like they're not critical reactors. They're like, RTGs, yeah, they're RTGs. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, then you've got a, a system of like, like nuclear rockets like uh, to potentially like use the nuclear energy to get into space then you have like ones that can help you travel through space uh, yeah there's some like amazing concepts out there and uh, like to be quite frank i'm not even sure like what has been prototyped and developed yet but it is like an amazing field of research and obviously the energy densities are like pretty real and pretty substantial when you're running that like mass calculation of like how expensive it is to to get things into space it becomes ever more important Let's talk about energy densities and how much energy you get a per certain amount of, of uh, material. How much better is uranium on that count than oil? Yeah, it's, it's six orders of magnitude. It's like over, like some, I think like three million times as like you get three million times as much for the same like mass input. It's, 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 it's unbelievable to think about. Like it's, it's like truly unbelievable. Now, that to me seems like it could uh, drop energy costs for everybody. Exactly, and exactly. I mean, that alone, people struggle to pay for the air conditioning bill or the heating bill, you know, and it's even worse in developing nations, non-existent really. But the thing is, is that you could actually see by, by implementing this, you could actually see a significant drop in energy costs for the individual. And by that token, it may actually start to drop costs on other things, you know, fuels produced through nuclear energy and things like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, we exactly like we need to get to like my vision is like we get us to a world of energy abundance. Like people do not have to think about energy. Like I'm not for efficiency. I'm not for like reduction in consumption. I'm for use as much energy as humanly possible to accomplish our goals and just decouple the environmental impact from that energy abundance. I mean, we should be thinking about using energy like we think about using computing power. Like, yeah, like the extreme like versions of that, like for a commercial enterprise, you have to like run economic trade-off calculations. But like for your average like daily use, you are not thinking about like rationing your computing resources, to, like send an email or watch like, you know, a Netflix show or something. You're just like, yeah, I, like my computer's powerful enough to do everything I want. And I, and I don't think about like the processing power used per second. That's what we need to get energy to. Absolutely. And with our God, our data dependent world, which is growing increasingly, you know, we call it the human data ohm, where we're building these enormous storage facilities for our data. And that is a huge energy user. And there's just no way around it. And that is the future. It's the present. And we have no choice but to continue to put more energy into it. But we can't do that with the, some people envision, you know, wind farms and solar and a sort of a mixed bag of energy production, green energy production devices, but it's not going to do it, is it? It's going to have to be nuclear. Yeah. I mean, let's come back to that six order of magnitude advantage. Like, sure, I'm sure there's some other way that we could deliver like energy to our bodies, but like oxygen is a really good job. So let's breathe oxygen. That's the best air to breathe for like a human body to function. And nuclear is the best way for human society to function as an energy source, like by orders of magnitude. So, yeah, let's do that. Now, what of thorium? I mean, there's been a lot of talk of thorium reactors. Is that a dead end or is it something else we can look at? Or do we not even need it when we have uranium? Yeah, people started talking about thorium decades ago when they thought that the uranium resources were constrained. That is no longer the case. Since then... All of these like myths and rumors have cropped up about how thorium is the solution. And it's like, quite frankly, it's all bullshit. It's a lot of like people using terminology that most other people don't understand and hiding certain select facts to like make their technology solution seem the best. And in doing so, often disparaging the other technologies, which they don't realize is actually subverting their own goals and making them like making people hate the entire industry, whether it's thorium or uranium altogether. So, yeah, I, I really don't like when, uh, like, sometimes they call them thorium bros, like, criticize the existing standard, like, workhorse, like, of the industry technology, your uranium oxide fuel pellets inside of a pressurized water. Because when they do so, to claim thorium is better, and in many ways, like, it's, it's far inferior, that, uh, yeah, they subvert the whole industry altogether. Now, your company is called Last Energy, which is a very apt name because it may be the only energy we need mm -hmm. now what what started you on that path what where how did you end up in this position of starting a nuclear revolution or ho hopefully doing so yeah six, six years ago i started the energy impact center i was just kind of a self-funded uh like uh, like effort in order to like, build an organization to address climate change and energy challenges from a first principles perspective. And we spent two years meeting with energy policymakers, climate scientists, and, and then getting really into the energy industry and then super deep diving into nuclear once we realized that all the things I thought about it six years ago were just totally mistaken. All of those like misconceptions around waste or safety or public perception. Once I had you know met with enough people to dispel those myths, you know, all of a sudden I realized, okay, like this is where we need to be spending all of our time and, and effort. And so after two years in research mode, we spun out a commercial entity, Last Energy, to like carry out the vision as to how we thought there'd be like a successful commercialization of really what is the existing technology repackaged in a different way to make it scale in terms of both like time to deliver and affordable cost to deliver. What's the time frame? Say we can start implementing this and get past the regulatory stuff and everything. How many decades are we away from a completely nuclear efficient energy economy? Yeah, so, so our goal is to get our first reactor up and running in 2025 and the long lead pull, the long pull intent there is licensing. So once you know we've gotten our permits and in parallel, we're gonna be building our first unit. We'll have that unit up and running in you know two to three years, let's say. And then we're gonna scale up production, make hundreds a year and then thousands a year and then you know, keep going from there. So I say that we could, I mean, listen, energy transitions still take decades no matter what. So I think it'll be probably like two decades until we've 
like fundamentally upended all energy on planet Earth. But in the next two years, you're going to start seeing um, the first step in that journey. There's also been the case that with the gigantic nuclear plants and when we try to build them, they, they don't even come in on budget or on time or anything like that. So do you expect pushback from that very industry with, with what you're doing? Yeah, but like, what do we care? We're not asking anyone else for money. We're building this. We've got customers. Uh, they're paying us and we're going to build them their products and deliver their products. And we don't really care what anyone else thinks. I mean, I think that's the real issue with like most efforts in like the new energy space is they put their hands out asking the government for money. And then they have to like make all of these cases and fight all these battles and make all of these concessions. And then having to like change their product to like go after grant money, which makes it disguise his product market fit and makes it even harder for them to actually implement their solution. And we just said, okay, let's build a product that is economically competitive that people want. And that's just like a purely commercial play. And we're gonna go out and we're gonna get contracts and get paying customers and build it for them and scale up that way. And we don't need to ask anyone for anything. I, mean, I, don't, I just don't care what they think irrelevant essentially yeah but the, hey this this world look what spacex did i mean there were people that were saying there's no way they're going to be able to compete with lockheed martin and you know, boeing and all that well they did so you can still do this in the modern world and they did it in the exact same way that that we're that like we're suggesting they like their first rockets did not land on their butts like their first rockets were simply shrunken down simpler versions of the existing nasa rockets that they, through a commercial entity, without all of the defense contractor overhead, delivered at a 10x cost reduction. That is exactly what we plan to do with nuclear energy. Same exact playbook. Mobility. Can you make a reactor like this mobile, for example, use it to power a ship or a submarine? I mean, can is, is that option available for this technology, this modular technology? Oh, totally. I mean, like, listen, most small reactors built in a very similar way to ours do power ships right now, like our, the U.S. Navy aircraft carriers and submarines. So the precedence is out there. And there are even a lot of commercial sea craft boats. The NS Savannah and Germany, I think, had one called like Otto something or other. And Russia's had a bunch. Yeah, maritime nuclear reactors are, are a thing and should be another area to explore. I don't know if we're going to have like the bandwidth to focus on like another branch of our technology as we're like getting really good at just perfecting the first and, and like increasing our manufacturing throughput, but I'd love to. I mean, it's like a personal fascination of mine to see a world full of nuclear power boats. So we'll just kind of like see where that fits in our strategic roadmap. I would definitely buy a ticket just on principle to ride on a nuclear powered <laughs> cruise ship. <laughs> yeah, it'd be awesome. It'd be, it'd be awesome. Yeah. Your water, you know, the, the swimming pool is heated by nuclear energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, it would, I love and that. it's always been, a, you know, with like the cruise industry, people are always saying, well, you, you can't spend all that fuel and, you know, look at the carbon footprint of that big old boat. <laughs> well, if you made it carbon neutral, you got something, you know. Um, oh, totally. And you'd probably be cheaper. Totally. You know, <laughs> that, yeah, no, I, I love the I love the way you think about it. Like, yeah, I love I love the vision. I mean, yes, like what you're doing right now, this is what is going to make people love nuclear, like imagining real world applications. That they can like put situations they can put themselves into and hear like two people laughing and enjoying the conversation. Like what you're doing right now is like the perfect form of nuclear advocacy. Well, what I want to see is a uranium mine and a nuclear reactor powering a Mars colony. Yeah. On Mars. Yeah, that, that'd be cool, too. I'm like, I'm more of a like a space station guy than I am a Mars colony guy. But yes, the, the basic concept applies still. <laughs> well, there we have a nuclear powered O'Neill cylinder in orbit <laughs> with, with one million <laughs> right. people living on it, you know, with, exactly. uh, rotating exactly. with artificial gravity and everything that you can want. I love uh, it. And then that's you, you really want to save Earth. That's how you do it move everybody into O'Neill cylinders and, and turn Earth into a nature preserve. I, I, I love that idea. But I think we could also do that if we just got rid of suburbs and like brought people into beautiful mansions in the sky. Like I think that is also a vision that like with today's technology is like totally feasible. If we just increase density, like got rid of suburbs, increase density, like put a suburb in the sky, like you could stack houses up 100 stories, essentially give people a lawn even. Um, like we could do that, increase density and make most of planet Earth a nature preserve like right now. And I think we should. Actually, that would be, you know, there, there's some amazing conceptual ideas regarding that where you build these arcologies, essentially gigantic buildings that are self-sufficient on, on food and residents and everything like that concentrated. 
and then you could put a nuclear reactor right at the heart of one and run it. Yep, it's such a cool vision. It's such a cool vision. Very futuristic. It almost reminds me of 1960s futures, I'm not, which is making a comeback. People are thinking big again like that. Yeah. And it should. Absolutely. And it should. Like, why not? Like, where are, like, yeah. And, like, it's, like, so pathetic that we don't have enough, like, people inspiring us to, like, like dream like we used to. Like, we need more people, like, and maybe this is what, like, podcasting will do. It's going to give, like, the dreamers and the innovators, like, a platform to spread these ideas of optimism and futurism like that that really like progress society forwards so like yes like we need to hear more of that well it's essential because if you don't then you stagnate exactly and you can't we can't allow that at this point because we're on the cusp of so much right now and it's actually weird because i think we're living in the most important period in human history where we're seeing the sort of the blossoming of a spacefaring civilization. We're seeing us take control of our own genetics and yep. Yep. medical science and all of this stuff. All is happening right now, which is weird that it's converging like that, but it is. And yep. nuclear energy needs to be a part of that because we're going to need to power it all. It will be a part of it. Yeah, it will. It will be. Uh, it will be the heart of any future civilization. And so, uh, the sooner that we get to unlocking the power of nuclear for human flourishing, the sooner we get to realize that vision. With a nuclear reactor, one of the most interesting things I have ever seen is the phenomenon of Cherenkov radiation, the blue glow. And I absolutely love it. That's the idea of something exceeding the speed of light in a liquid amazes me. And that you get that beautiful blue glow. Now, do your reactor, are your reactors going to glow like that? I imagine they would be, right? Yeah, the problem is they're going to be totally sealed. Like, no, like even our workers can't access our reactors. That was one of like the regulatory simplifications we came up with. We're just going to like bury the nuclear island at the start of life. It's a little more expensive in some ways, but it definitely resolves any like licensing issues around worker safety or public safety. So we bury them and nobody, unfortunately, is ever going to be able to see them while they're operating. Now, once you have these reactors in operation, essentially, do you foresee that it's just going to be off the shelf parts for maintenance of these things and that it's there's not going to be any you're not going to have to custom make anything right. You'll just send out a part. It's already pretty much that way. Like we've designed our system where every single component is quote unquote off the shelf. Like, yeah, our our tanks are shaped to like fit our components, but that you can call that off the shelf too, if you really wanted to. So yeah, everything already is like standard supply chain, hot swappable, um, easy to maintain. Now running time. Now reactors all, you know, they're required to have all kinds of maintenance and downtime and inspections and things like that, which is probably overkill. <laughs> What's can you you think you can tackle that and get that out of the way to where the reactor isn't down a significant amount of time if it doesn't need to be. Yeah, so one of the our, like the differences between our technology and the traditional technology isn't really like a component change, but like an operational modality change. So what we do is we bury our reactors and we bury a new one every six years and we simply drop another one in a hole in the ground. And that's how we, and so like we, we don't need to inspect the old one because we never run a reactor more than six years, which is the lifetime that nuclear fuel is certified up to. So yeah, that's our, that's our little hack to make it easy for us. Now let's paint a little bit more bleak of a picture Uh-oh. and say something something prevents this and that we can't switch to nuclear. How much more time do we have at our energy production methods as they are? How much more time do we have before we have to start tightening the belt? We start seeing blackouts, the phones stop working, things like that. If we don't do this, what does the future look like? Listen, increasing energy across the world is going to be a rule that that overwhelms anyone's ideas around what they want society to look like. We're just going to earn more fossil fuels. Nobody's going to stop people from getting energy when they really want it. And if if that is in a world where the climate is becoming increasingly erratic, average temperatures are increasing, that's what's going to happen. But nobody's going to stop consuming energy. It's just it's just not realistic. There might be unlimited methane in the ground. We don't know. Like what what is really funny is actually we don't even know where methane comes from. We, We do not know if methane comes from primarily from fossil fuels or it comes from like literally the birth of our planet and all sorts of you know pressures of the C's and the H's as our planet solidifies. So there, I mean, like, look at Venus. Venus has a lot of methane. There were no fossils there. So there might be unlimited methane to extract from our crust, and we just got to keep developing more technologies to extract it. So in, in a world with no nuclear, it is a world where we are, like, burning ever more natural gas, and we just live in a really hot climate, 
and people move more towards the poles over the course of 100 years. And I actually don't think it's going to be that catastrophic. It's just like, yeah, the billion poorest people are going to suffer, but they're already suffering now and nobody really seems to care. So that's probably what the world will look like. I want a world filled with giant cooling towers because I've always thought the cooling towers of nuclear power plants were beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up near one and I, I always thought, you know, that is a, that is that right there is the future. You know, that is. That yeah, is, I love that you love that. But unfortunately, most people think it's smoke. <laughs> they don't, real, yeah, they don't, it's water they don't realize it's just no. water and it's not even water I that know, came into contact I know. with anything. It's just water. I know that was a fight we were unwilling to fight. So we kind of gave up on that. We don't have cooling towers. We just use air cooling and it's like way less efficient and more expensive. We just essentially have giant radiators on our roof because we were like too afraid of. That was one thing that we were just like, we can't fight every battle. So if people think it's smoke, we're just not going to do it. And yeah, maybe some point in the future use seawater cooling. I don't know. Well, that's that's not a that that is. <laughs> Public perception is a problem here because, I mean, even if you look at, at a fusion project like ITER, they had to avoid any any mention of the word nuclear when they did that because it, it almost has a stigma when it shouldn't. Yeah, funny, that's in France, especially in France. In of all France, places. yes. <laughs> Crazy. Do you think the, that uh, fusion is just too far off and that we, we really shouldn't rely on the assumption that we're going to get it and that we should just go nuclear now? Uh, you know, fission now. I, I just I just don't know why people want fusion. I mean, most people who say they want fusion, it's like, oh, it's like a clean, unlimited energy source. It's actually more radioactive than fission. And it's not uh, unlimited. Like the like the fuel doesn't exist. Like you need to transmute elements or like harvest them from the moon. This is, this is like the most expensive energy source that humanity could ever create. And if like what you don't like about fission is radiation, newsflash, fusion is radioactive too. And five times as much neutron production per unit energy. And neutron is the type of radiation that not only destroys materials, but that transmutes other atoms to become radioactive. And like the fusion community is just like sweeping that all under the rug right now to get away like with as much positive publicity as they can have. But like the minute that their technology advances, the point that they're doing like actual power productions and people realize how radioactive it is, there goes all your public support. Now, the radioactive iodine, the only real problem that's that's faced by by uh, fission production, energy production, yep. very, very short half life, as you mentioned. And yep. the fact is, what does it decay into? I mean, what are we left with after it's safe? Just normal iodine or what's it do? Yeah. So, yeah. So when you, when you fission an atom, you, there's like a hundred different potential isotopes that get created along some sort of like statistical, you know, probability curve. And then each one of them has a different half-life and some are short. And so they transmit very quickly and some are longer. And so it takes them a long time. And they follow these decay chains. And so it's like, and it's not a very like, and there's like some probability in which they emit a beta and decay into one thing or emit a gamma and turn to another. And so it's, it's not like a very clear cut answer. There's like a chart that you would have to look at. But um, at some point, the decay chain stops with a stable atom that is non radioactive. And yeah, it's just another element. But like, we're talking about such a small quantity. But just like put in perspective, the total amount of iodine 131, the only dangerous radionuclide that uh, that was emitted, uh, you know, that gets emitted in like a nuclear meltdown. In the case of Fukushima, where you had three gigawatt scale core meltdowns, only 28 grams of iodine-131 was created. 28 grams. That's 1.3 teaspoons, not even a tablespoon. So like, yes, it's dangerous, but it's also in such small quantities. And then, yes, it just within 90 days, it all becomes something else. So that is like not radioactive. And you're talking about a teaspoon, a teaspoon. Like it has the same toxicity as chlorine. And yes, I would not like drink, like I would not take a teaspoon of chlorine and drink it. Like I would consider that like highly toxic and a bad idea, but like put a teaspoon of chlorine in a pool, no longer toxic, right? Like you use, like people do that intentionally to like help clean their pools. But you're talking about something that is like, yes, potentially hazardous, but isn't around for a very long time and is never around in large quantities. So it's like, it's just like a non-issue. And there's an elephant in the room with that isotope, um, iodine-131. We make way more than a teaspoon on this planet each year for cancer therapy. <laughs> so. Exactly. Oh, isn't that? Yeah, that's the most ironic part. The, like the one radioisotope that could hurt someone in a nuclear meltdown because it the, like it theoretically gives, you know, some like very small amount of people thyroid cancer is used to treat thyroid cancer. Like it's that is true. the greatest irony on planet Earth. And on top of that, too, is that... 
if you have an exposure, okay, distribute iodine pills. And we've known about that since the 1950s. Oh, you don't even need to. And I actually disagree with that because that actually creates more fear. When people take an iodine pill, it like makes them afraid of like what is happening and the stress kills more people. I'd say don't distribute iodine pills. Like nobody needs it. <laughs> like once again, Fukushima, three core meltdowns, no safety system, like every single safety system failed, including the roof. And there was not enough exposure to iodine to warrant anyone taking any action whatsoever. So that would just... Like just don't yeah, worry about I, it. I mean, yeah. I guess a nuclear war, you know, you, you might distribute it or something like that, but I'm not even sure then. Um, I get... Yeah, then you need like, uh, yeah, then you got all sorts of other types of radiation issues. Yeah. I, so, okay. I'm not saying radiation isn't dangerous, by the way. I'm saying like radiation from a nuclear accident isn't dangerous. So yeah, radiation from nuclear weapons is like a whole nother like, like issue and problem that I'm like, obviously not advocating for a bunch of nuclear weapons being dropped. Yeah. Very dirty, yeah. but we're not talking, yeah, very dirty, but we're yeah. talking about power generation, not, not, not explosions. It just seems to me a lost opportunity as far as, you know, when talking about climate change, that that we just didn't do this from the start and like the entire world in France, essentially. But as far as France goes, you know, how much of their energy production is nuclear? It's a majority, isn't it? Yeah, so something like 80 percent. And what's funny is that they're like a victim of their own success because they built a whole bunch of nuclear and then by consequence, their nuclear development industry also died. And so nobody was advocating for it. And so then people, even in France, like begin to like take it for granted and not like it that much anymore after the course of decades. So there's a real like irony in how all this ends up playing out. Yeah, but the big problem is that if you don't do that, then you're building coal plants, which I believe is what the, what the Germans are doing. You know, <laughs> I, I know. And this is why I'm like, yeah, we need to not only like go 100 percent nuclear. We need to go 1000 percent nuclear. We need to keep building it. So there's an industry to always defend it. And then we just need to keep on like leveling up how much energy planet Earth creates and uses. Now, let's take a look at, at the last one we haven't talked about yet. Three Mile Island mm -hmm. the disaster there. Almost nothing was emitted in that. Right? Yeah, you, yeah, you still call it a disaster. You just called it a disaster, even though no one got hurt. And like there was a disaster. Yeah. yeah, it was more like a it was more like a small outgassing. <laughs> yeah, small, <laughs> tiny little accident. Yeah. Industrial accidents happen all the time that don't hurt people. This was one of those. Like, not even a big deal. Was it avoidable? Yeah, I think there was like some equipment malfunction and then some human response to that. But industrial accidents happen all the time. People break equipment. It happens. Okay. It's like, that's what you have insurance for. So yeah, just get an insurance policy and then don't like panic the public about it. And compare this to much, much scarier stuff like chemical accidents and how many of those have happened. Oh God, I can't even, I can't even begin to describe. I mean, it's like, it's like horrifying to think about. Like, like I mean, like we just saw... Oh, man. No, it's like, yeah, like that destroyed, like, ugh, like Bhopal and in India and like, oh, my God, there have been so many. Yeah, unbelievable. Bhopal was unbelievably bad. And, yeah. you know, the thing is, nothing that's ever happened in nuclear has ever compared to that. I know. And that's why I hate even like mentioning the same sentence, because it's like still like a feel like it like, creates this like cognitive like resonance between the two concepts. So I don't even like to talk about it because it's just like not even it's not even worth comparing. Like I would compare a nuclear accident to tripping down the stairs and like bruising your elbow. And that's it. And not even, I mean, that, even that's a bad comparison because like people don't get hurt in nuclear accidents. No one got hurt in Three Mile Island or the Fukushima's. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like, like, like being like irritated by an allergy. And it's worth noting here, look at the French. They've been doing this for decades and they've never had an accident. But I think there should be more nuclear accidents. Like, I think we should actually have more nuclear accidents. More. <laughs> yeah, of course, because then people won't be afraid of it. And remember, it doesn't hurt anyone. I'm not saying that people should get hurt. I'm saying that we should expose people to something that they are afraid of so they're no longer afraid of it. So, yeah, we like if we had a ton of nuclear accidents and no like we had a nuclear accident every single year and nobody was getting hurt in any of them, people would stop worrying about it. And it's the worrying that hurts people. Well, the other thing, too, is that they, there's an effect here early in air travel when we were you know flying everywhere in the 1950s. There were crashes all the time. You know, I know, but people actually die in those. And so that's why oh, it's like, yeah, I hate, absolutely. once again, like I hate comparing that to nuclear because like when a commercial nuclear reactor melts down, no one gets injured, even when every single safety system fails. And so like, I don't even like comparing it to like plane accidents where it's like really sad because people actually die. The point is though, is that in the development of the aircraft, they hardly ever crash now. Commercial aircraft, I mean, how often does that happen? Not very. And that's right. But I'm saying that, use that analogy for the chemical plants like that actually do well, hurt actually people. the chemical plants that well, like Bhopal and all that. That was that was just 
bad management, dangerous management. You don't really have that in nuclear because you can <laughs> you can end the reaction, right? Or hopefully end unless something goes wrong. You no, know, water-based reactors, they always like the they reaction always dies. Yeah. Most people yeah, most people don't realize that the minute that your water's gone, the minute it gets too hot and it boils off, that's it for your nuclear reaction. There is no runaway reaction. Yeah, yeah the neutrons don't have yeah, the neutrons don't have a way to I mean, I guess they just go off into the, you know, wherever, but you need that water to, for it to even function. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. What do you do? Okay. So you've got this water that you're, you know, your, your nuclear acting reactor is using. Can you use that indefinitely and recycle it? I mean, do you, does that ever, even if it's safe, it never really has to go back into the environment, does it? Um, or, or is it just something that you're going to have to replace and top off? Ours is a totally sealed system. So like, yeah, we don't have to replace any water. It just circulates internally in a, like a fully sealed system. And yeah, like when you like do maintenance and stuff, you know, maybe a little bit comes out and you put a little bit in, but it's, it's I mean, it's just water. Yeah. There's no danger in the actual water itself, even though it's exposed to a fuel rod. Right. Right. I mean, there's some tritium in it, but like not dangerous amounts. That's and like, I think that's what though. people get confused about. <laughs> Tr- yeah, and, and, good. <laughs> and exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's where you get your fuel for a few, for these fantasy fusion reactors. Do you actually see that as, a, as an option eventually is to use these reactors to actually create things like tritium on an industrial scale? I mean, can you actually modify it that way to to produce that type of stuff? Yeah. But like, why would like what do you like what's tritium good for? The only thing it's good for are like like once again fantasy fusion reactors that are more radioactive and will never like be economically feasible or bombs so it's like <laughs> not much use to making tritium intentionally so now this type of a reactor cannot be used to make any kind of a bomb right there's just no yeah, way the, to do it yeah the only types of reactors that can be used are like the types that like the russians built like the rbmk is or like your heavy water reactor the, anything that has in situ fuel replacement can be used to make weapons grade material. Anything that you don't have in situ, in situ fuel replacement can't. So they're naturally proliferation proof. So how do you deal with the fuel as it degrades? Do you just replace the whole reactor vessel? And Yeah, know? we just drop in a new reactor vessel with fresh fuel every six years, just right next to the old one. And then after the plant's life, they all just get carted away. And hopefully, I mean, this will be like the first one will wrap up 50 years from now. So, like, hopefully at that point, society has, like, these economically productive uses for spent nuclear fuel, which are really just, like, gold mines of radioisotopes that have, like, commercial value. That's something I always wondered about, is that if you could go back into those spent fuel rods, there's some weird stuff there. And I know, it it's almost amazing. looks like a mine, so amazing. you know. <laughs> or... <laughs> yeah, some future society is going to look at these things as treasure troves and invent all sorts of cool medical treatments, detectors, sensors. Uh, I mean, just like little batteries, like so many amazing things will come out of uh, will come out of spent nuclear fuel. What some people deride as nuclear waste. And there will be there will be a day where it's it no longer exists. <laughs> it, it, we will have used it up. It's just right, we need right, 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 right. we, we need more of it. We, yeah, need, we more need more of it. of it. Like that's my whole that's what We need more nuclear waste, not less. Well, that'd be fun. Is if your nuclear reactors after they go out of service after fifty years or whatever, and they're just sitting there waiting, waiting for a new life. And I kind of find that very poetic. Me too. Me Especially too. in the sense that the nuclear age it was, as I said in the beginning of the interview, the most important development in human history so far we harnessed the atom that's as big as harnessing fire which we didn't even do one of our hominid predecessors did so (laughs) so we so we we we, we're just it's something special and it's something that we need to use to solve our problems right now and it is the one thing that can so i wish you great luck in this and i hope to see i hope to see the fruited plain dotted with nuclear reactors thank you thank you as much energy as we want Oh, I love it. I love the vision. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Let's let's get together sometime too. You bet. You bet. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. 